Okay, so now the meeting. Well, thank you. The meeting is now being recorded. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to post my YouTube address for the videos for this class. There's there's three small tutorial videos and one um, video on the Quilters Knot. If anybody doesn't know the Quilters Knot, uh, that is a wonderful little video to, to learn that knot. When ha in hand sewing, we do a tremendous amount of knotting, <laughs> especially in this process. And so when you have to knot a thread uh, every 10 minutes, it's nice to know the Quilters Knot. It's a really quick knot. So I encourage everyone to learn that knot and to use these YouTube videos at will to just review and go to my presentation. Let's see. Okay, here we are. Uh, Jacobian dimensions. I always call my technique felted will applique with embroidery embellishment. So here's the pillow. And what I'm going to do with this little launch is kind of talk about what you should have done so far with uh, making your, your uh, I'm hoping everybody's got their pre-work done because after this lesson uh, and this kickoff you can just go right right to to cutting uh, pinning basting and sewing and I'm going to look at each one of these flowers and fruits with you as we go along first I know that uh, um, oh I have to move this little Okay, thing out of the way. That people wanted to review, whoops. People wanted to review the threads and the fabrics. Is there any questions? Does anybody have any questions after I posted this picture? Did this help everyone in understanding what fabrics and uh, threads to use? I hope. So, so the threads on the top left, Right. Color is it done from left to right? Yes. Okay. So the gum nut poppies is the far left small green silk. And then the, the next one would be the teal and the grape. A, 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 a lot of these, everything that says Jacobian are custom threads that I had made and they're not available anymore. Um, all the way down to even touch of autumn is because she went out of business. This is this is my life. Um, I find these wonderful threads. I kid them up, and then they go away. So then I'm constantly looking for more, which is why I don't. Re I, I have never really published anything in my directions that I print with all these fabric. I mean these threads. Threads is always a concern unless I can get it from weeks. Same thing with fabrics. Uh, a lot of them are weeks because they have wonderful colors. Some of them I dye because it's just not what I'm looking for. And so you'll find that your tangerine uh, fabrics are all a little different. But as long as you have contrast in the three fabrics, you're fine. So I listed them in order of how I built them in the kit. And then this should help you to figure out what's going on with all the uh, threads and, and fabrics. Any questions on the kit? Yeah, so so I'm just looking at my kit threads, and I have the. Um, it's a little hard to see on on the screen here because it's quite small on my screen. Um, so I have a, a kind of the the brown at the bottom. Then I have an orange. Um, then I have a red, uh, a yellow, um, kind of a. Uh, two shades of yellow, then another red, and then the blue. So my kit doesn't seem to match what you have here. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. It, it, can you see what you should? Well, you know what? We're going to go over all the flowers and all the fruits and talk about threads. After we do that, if you're still wondering what okay. thread to use where, then I'll help you personally. Okay, because that like say, right. to me as mm -hmm. if I have some that are different. Yeah, no, that's not that makes sense. And I, sometimes you know the, the the kit maker might have had something left over from another class. I make these 
at, when I have a class, I make the kits. It's not like I have them in an inventory. Right. So we might have had something from another class, and it was carded different, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So moving on, hopefully everybody did a tracing of their pattern. And this is just a visual of the patterns underneath. And this is my tracing. Just to show you how I went about it. I didn't trace the flower. I just put in the line that I'm going to embroider. But I did make a lot of lines on that stem for positioning. And then I removed the um, tissue paper from the pattern. And I go over everything with a micron pen. You can use a ballpoint pen. But the reason I do that is because then I can darken those pencil lines without harming the pattern below. And they're much easier to see when I then take this tissue and put it on top of the black wool. On the stems, the center stem, which is the basis for, for the entire piece, I just put the um, tracing lines on the left-hand side because I'm going to use that for guide to lay my felted wool piece right alongside. So that, that's why I did that. And with these guidelines, if they show, you can take them out. But, but I try to keep them not, from not, you know, from showing by embroidering over them, by appliquing over them, so that I just leave the guide stitching right into the piece. This is a detail of how I did my um, running stitches. And as you can see, the, I'm, I'm stitching right through the paper into the black wool, and I'm leaving those green tails. I do a back stitch at the beginning and at the end, and I leave about an inch, inch and a quarter tail. And then at the end, I have these tails hanging out after I rip. Then I'll pull the fabric north, south, east, and west to get out any loops. And I'll take those tails and give them a little pull, and it'll flatten all the stitches nicely. The last thing I do with this embroidery guide running stitch is to cut all the tails off. Because trust me, the, the running stitches are not going to leave. They're going to kind of stay there embedded in the wool. They won't undo. And you don't really want to have those tails hanging when you begin to embroider and or applique. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. This doodle cloth I uploaded for anybody who wanted to do a practice piece. Um, and, and when I have a face-to-face -face class, we do a practice piece just to get an idea about the dimension uh, technique, which is a needle slanting technique. And we can just look at this um, diagram at the bottom, and you can see the applique fabric and the base fabric. And the needle slants up from the bottom and then down from the top. And as you can see from the diagram, the needle is always parallel. So the slant that you come up on, you want to go down the same way. And actually, the needle is piercing the fabric just under the edge of the applique piece. And then at the top, when you, when you needle down, you're needling down in the applique piece so it's easy for you to see where you're going to put your needle and you can be more accurate. When you come up in the applique piece, like in traditional applique, it doesn't really show because you're only catching a thread or two, but it shows in wool because you have to catch more than a thread. Or you have to catch two or three threads because there is a fray factor. So when your um, thread is going to show, you want to rest it slightly and lightly on the edge, and we're using matching threads so they disappear. So if you look at the strawberry, you really can't see the red applique edge, but it is showing. If you get right up and close and personal, you can see it. I 
can't emphasize enough that you have to be very light with your touch. When you're pulling down on a thread, when you get to that last little loop, you just go slow. If you think the thread is not resting tight enough to the edge of your applique, don't pull it until you need it up. And then you can pull it with a lot more control when when you're you have your needle on the upside of the of the fabric. Does that make sense? I do show it in the video on YouTube pretty clearly. And if you watch that a couple of times, it gives you a good idea. And you will notice that your pieces will definitely puff up. And it's very dimensional looking. If you get the right slant and you don't pull too if you pull too tight, it's going to make like a dent or a pucker in the edge of your work. Is there any questions on this needle slanting diagram or this technique? Okay, then. So let's take a look at this. This visual is really up close and personal on the main stem which will be the first thing that you'll really get involved in, and obviously the grape details here too. And as you can see, the touch of autumn um, thread is very multicolor. And when I first started working on this piece, I didn't realize it was gonna be a class, of course, and I was just playing. And I had bought at, at a EGA seminar, this beautiful multicolor touch of autumn um, thread and I thought, well, this is nice. It's multicolor, but you know, nature sort of has a lot of a lot of colors in it. So why don't I just use it to do this stem? And I really loved it. But, but as you can see, it doesn't really match the the green. It goes in and out in all these different colors. But I think it's a pretty look. You can also see that the applique is so light, you can actually the applique stitches like lumps on the side of the stem because I never ever pull it tight. Sometimes, I, and when I was making this piece, I think um, my center stem got a little skinny in a certain place, and I added on the left side, you can see I added that stem stitch, and I know that that was visually to thicken up that piece because I thought piece looked a little maybe emaciated. So sometimes in this surface work, you can, you know, and you have my full permission to just do your thing. If you want to thicken one of your um, sides of one of your stems, you can, you can just put a little running stem stitch along the side and end it with a little curl or do whatever you want. As long as it pleases you and you're having a good time, that's what we're that's why we do this. So, so the stem is, is um, and I'm going to talk more about placing the, the center stem, but that's the first thing to look at. And uh, the other thing I wanted to speak about um, is this leaf that you see on the upper left hand side. It's a, a, a base leaf, and then I call that yellow part, which is really called bronze in your kit. And when you see this, it is kind of a bronze color, bronzy yellow. Um, that's what I call the underleaf. And you'll see that both of those pieces are appliqued all the way around. I don't try to mesh or sew them together in any way where they meet. But I first I do the, the one base leaf, and then I put that little underleaf there, and I sort of hold it snug with my thumb while I'm appliquing it to get it nice and close. So the result is the appearance that the leaf is turning. On the grapes, and uh, on my grapes, you can see that some of them are um, overlapped. I think it's not very important whether you overlap them. As long as you put a bunch of grapes in there and they look good to you, it's not so critical that it looks exactly like mine or the pattern, but just that they are have enough space between the grapes and the stem 
and it pleases you. So I, I you know, when you're working with small pieces like this, don't don't be too too concerned that oh, the, the center left one should be overlapped, whatever. And I put the colonial group of colonial knots here and there to make some dimension. I also moved my over dyed felted wool and cut some darker and some lighter to give some dimension and change in color. So sometimes you'll take your piece and there's no right side or wrong side. So you might want to cut a couple of things from one side, flip it over, cut a couple more from the other side. Kind of examine your piece of wool and see how do I want to cut this and you know because fussy cutting makes the difference when you're looking to create dimension and, and change of color and so forth. Is there any questions on this picture? Okay, mo moving on. This this um there's two things to talk about here with this picture and that is the um Stems on the left, you make a guide, you should have an embroidery guide, and my embroidery guide is underneath there. So I just chain stitched right over the running stitches. And then when I get to the buds, I have a group of, I think there's four elongated Lazy Daisy stitches there to um, be, become the sepal. You might put three. I would never use two or, I would use three or four, but it depends on how your work ends up. There's no right or wrong here. It's surface embroidery. You can really, and it's a flower. So you, you can put as many that are gonna work. I didn't put any on the leaf, the leaf bud, which is this, the lower one, but you could. And then the way this chain stitches just feed into the tip of the applique, Basically, we're all on our own there. Sometimes I even like wrap uh, a little bit of thread over the tip just to get it to lay down. And this one worked kind of nice. Um, but there's, you know, there's definitely a change in color there. The center of this blue fantasy flower, I did that in hand. So I did kind of a uh, a little stuffed yo-yo. When you cut a circle and, and stitch around it, pull it and stuff it. And then I put that on after I had everything else appliqued. And I'm pretty sure I did the seed stitches after everything was finished and it was on there. What, what order you do that in is entirely up to you. It doesn't really matter you, to, you know at what point you want to put those little seed stitches in some of my students have said well can I put them in before I make the oyo of course whatever whatever you like you can see that the stitches really show on this blue flower but because they match and I had pretty good accuracy it looks fine any questions on this so this definitely the blue the dark blue went down first and I tucked them tight to each other as I appliqued and then I put the light blues on top and they went all the way through. I did not put the light blue on the dark blue in hand. I, I never work in hand because you won't achieve any dimension if you work in hand and then put it on. It kind of flattens everything out. And I love colonial knots so you can see they're just everywhere. They're wherever I think it's a little knot and I just put them on there. Any questions on this visual? Everybody still awake? Okay. Okay, here's my favorite flower, the fantasy flower. And this is uh, to, to achieve the dimension in this piece. There was a lot of layering. So the bottom mustard piece is appliqued first, and I never appliqued something that's going to be covered by another piece. I just leave the, I left the top of that open. And then I put the light uh, maize color on top and appliqued all the way through 
the mustard and the black. This is a stab stitching motion on the tack stitch and trying to keep that needle slanting idea in your head. And then the last white piece goes on top and it, that needles all the way through the maze, the mustard and the black. Then on top of that is the bronze piece, which needles all the way through the white, the maize, the mustard, and the black. And then after that piece, the top piece is put on, I added all those colonial knots in the silk, just to, just to give it a little more interest. And I'm not sure if I thought that was a serrated edge or some kind of fur on it. I don't know, but I just, I liked it. You can do as you wish with these things. If you, you know, everybody has interesting stitches in their uh, intellectual arsenal. So I would encourage my students always to, you know, if you want to use a different stitch for the uh, stamens or if you like a pistol stitch or uh, if you want to outline things, just whatever makes you happy. On the leaf, on the right-hand side, you see the leaf with the underleaf part. It's a two-part leaf. For some reason, I put a, a stem stitch in the middle of, of that to create a line. And I think I probably looked at that and said it doesn't look like it's turning enough so I added that stem stitch in the middle uh, that curved stem stitch to give it some continuity sometimes you might want to do that uh, if it looks good you don't you don't have to put that line in or if you just like the way that line looks you can put that, that in do you understand what I'm saying about that continuity line in the middle of that leaf, I hope. That makes sense to me. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear somebody say something because <laughs> make sure you're all still there. Never, okay. don't we don't forget to. Right. Okay. Don't forget too. You can also use your cursor to point out these details. Oh yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay. Yeah, right. See my cursor? Yeah, I should be doing that, and I forget that. Um, here's here's the uh, carnation, which has, this has that same outline right here. And I know I put that outline here because that that meadow uh, fabric, I think it just wasn't sh crisp enough for me. So I went and I added that uh, detail all the way around, outlining that just on the top. I didn't do it under here because I thought that it would would make a little more clarity. The top of this is cut with a pinking shear. And I left all the top open. And on the original, you can peek in and see that I just added these later and put the little colonial knots on there. They only go down to about here because I did add them after all, all these pieces were appliqued. But again, in the layering technique, for dimension, this top piece goes all the way through this piece, this piece, and the black. And this bronze, I mean, meadow color piece goes all the way through this piece, this piece, this piece, and the black. And that's what gives it its dimension that it's needling through all the layers. Here, I was very successful getting this under leaf in here, so I didn't put a clarifying line there. I just put a, a, a line like a vein line. So you can do whatever you like. Oops, let's see. Oh, I see that the middle of the mouse move advances this. I didn't know that. Okay, pomegranate. There's a couple of things to study here. Here's your main stem, and the main stem ends and then it goes into embroidery. And then you can see that the chain stitch is covered with uh, a stem stitch at the top. And I know why I did that, because I wanted it to look thick and then a little less thick and then thinner at the end. 
So here I did it with the wool, and then I went into um, a chain combination with a stem, and then I just followed up with the chain. And the skinniest things are the little curlicues, which are just straight stem stitch. Because when I drew this originally, I was looking at it and saying, how am I going to go from thick to thin to thinnest? And so that's how I solved that. The um, pomegranate is constructed. There's the yellow. This is the lemon. You have a couple of different colors of yellow in this. And the maize is used on the fantasy flower, and it's used in the middle of the blue. The maize is kind of a buttercup color. This yellow in the middle here is lemon chiffon. It's very, very bright light uh, lemon. And I put this middle piece in first onto my lemon and then I layered it and when you cut this pomegranate you have to cut this little window out so this is a layer of lemon which already has this on here and the reason I did that first this is the only thing I did in hand first before I applied it's because it was the only way I could figure out how to get this thing in the middle was to applique the, the the red middle to the yellow and then put it inside this window and line it up so that it looked good. Can you do it afterwards? Probably, but I know I didn't because I wanted to position how it looked in here. Then I applique the middle um, of this in hand because I wanted this pomegranate to look off like a like a rounded fruit you can do it in hand and it and then put it all on there and it's going to puff up anyway because it's layered and it'll look rounded then i added these uh texture lines on the edge i don't know why i just thought it looked flat so i just added them it also changes the color when you Add a texture, um, a thread texture to it. This is the pomegranate thread and the, the pomegranate wool. Both are weeks and they're very nice colors. Um, I think they're um, is that Louisiana hot sauce. I'm not sure. Is there any questions on this one? I guess not. Uh, yeah, Deborah, there's a question in the chat. Oh, I can't, can't read the chat. So, um, um, Ann, Warner, Ann Warner asked, it says you've been talking about working in hand or not. Do you frame the whole thing to work on or you use the hoop for the individual section that you're working on? I do all my work in hand. I never, I never use a hoop with felted wool um, because I move it a lot in my hand uh, and I move it so much I manipulate it so much that if I had it flat in any kind of a frame I wouldn't be able to manipulate it but when I say in hand um, in this instance I'm saying I'm using I'm working with the applique piece in hand and making an assembly that then I will put on the black base so the pomegranate was an assembly where I added the red to the yellow, and then I put it behind the next one. And I assembled the pomegranate in my hand, okay. and then I put the assembled pomegranate and put it on the left. So I hope that makes sense. And if somebody asks a question in chat, maybe my moderator or somebody can tell me tell me that it's happening because I can't see the chat when I'm looking at the um, full screen, unfortunately. 
Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, if there's no other questions, I hope I answered the in hand question. Um, this is another detail showing that same configuration of chain stitches and how they come into the main stem, and it also shows the strawberry. The strawberry um, shape works much better when you see it in the whole pillow because when I look at it up close, I'm like, that kind of is a weird looking strawberry. But anyway, adding those, and this isn't a great photo, unfortunately, of this, but adding the seed stitches to this after you applique it, when you add the seed stitches, you don't want to go through the whole thing. Any texture that's added to an applique piece should be just sewn on the top applique. I do it afterwards, but I never needle all the way through. So I'm just working on the top piece of the fabric and obviously running my needle behind to pick up the next stitch and then running behind to pick up the next stitch. Does that make sense? Embellishments are generally just on the surface of the applique. They don't go all the way through to the base. Okay, so here's another example where I have used, after I put this, the base leaf and then the underleaf, I used a, a line of stem stitching in here and with that beautiful gum nut, gum nut poppies to clarify that this leaf is turning. And I think it really is successful when you look at it, you know, from far away. Or, or when you generally would view this pillow, obviously not this close, that it really makes it look like it's turning. Down here, I added these this little stem because I'm think oh, it looked a little skinny here, so I put this in. And why I'm telling you this is because if you're if you cut yours and it looks a little skinny over here, you might want to just put a stem stitch. You might want to just put a little curl. I mean, it's up to you. Everybody knows the difference, I hope, between stem stitch and straight stitch. When you work a stem, you're always bringing your needle up to the right of the, of the work. And it really kind of curves in a way that it, it looks very different than a straight stitch. I used a lot of stem stitching. And on this, there's a little blue um, thread in here to embellish and one little colonial knot on these little guys. Okay, so here's the main stem. And if you can think in terms of your own black wool and you should have a guideline running along here in green running stitches. If you've done your pre-work, this, this is going to be all green running stitches, and you're going to place this piece of felted wool right along those guide stitches, slightly covering them. And if you'd like, you can use a little bit of glue based, but then based with just a running white basting stitch so that, that these guys don't move. Because getting this placed appropriately is going to drive the of the design. Once you get this work done, all the fruits and flowers come off this main stem. So you really want to use your acetate placement guide, get it in the right spot, anchor it with a little bit of glue, and then baste it good so that you can applique it with that touch of autumn and you'll have a nice base, you know, uh, stem from which all the flowers and fruits will then added. Question? Okay, I'm going to move. And I'm going to re-emphasize <laughs> this drawing, which is needle, always needle up from the bottom, up in the black, and down in the color, and you want to needle up and away from the work, and then you actually, I flip my needle in my hand, 
to change the motion to stab down, and then I place it accurately on the edge of the applique and needle down in the same direction with the needle. So the two needles are parallel. And if you watch that YouTube video that I did of how to the applique with wool and seeing how to pull it and and how gentle you have to be with this, if you keep a light hand, you're gonna have a lot of success. Did you send out the link to those YouTube videos? Because if so, I yes. don't think you got it. I did in the chat window. I can do it again. If you could send it in an email, I think that would be good. Okay. Just that way, if someone didn't manage to watch this, I, you know, manage to watch this, um, then they can they can see that. Absolutely. So you want when I do the email, I have to do it from the group, right? Yeah, because then it goes to everybody who's in the group, right? Okay, okay, okay. I did post it in this window, but I'll be happy to post it there. There, like I said, there's three videos that pertain specifically to the uh, techniques here, and then there's one video on the quilters knot, which I encourage all my students and Michelle. You can attest to this. I really drive that home because I think it's a great tool for any for hand sewing. It's an absolute great tool to have. It's very, very useful. Yes, yes, it is very useful. And one more time, use a light, soft touch. Never pull your work tight. I think a lot of us, um, especially people who have done uh, counted thread work and drawn thread and pulled thread, you're used to being really tight with a piece of linen because it, it gives a little bit, but not. Um, certainly, um, canvas and some of these things, they don't, they don't even move. So you're used to working tight. And when you go to this type of work, you really need to stay very light in your touch. And so, um, the feather is my new, <laughs> I don't know if I can. Stephen, am I able to type here if this is your meeting? Yes. Uh... Okay. Okay. Well, so um, hold on. I'm sorry on the share thing. Well, yeah, try it out. I'm not sure on this. Hmm. It may be easier just to bring up a Notepad and type there. You know, fill out, fill your screen with a large Notepad file. No, see, I see nothing typing here. Okay. Then I'm going to go back to. Uh... Let's see. How about here? Can now you can also this? you can also use the the chat since everybody's on here. Right? Everybody can see, we'll see the chat. Okay, maybe that'd be easier. Right. Okay. Uh, Door Mills is in, uh, I think it's New Hampshire. Uh, they have a website. They sell um, bolts, which I buy. They also sell smaller pieces. They have some kits available. They have a very nice product. So that's one resource. There's Weeks Dye Works. They also have a website, Weeks Dye Works. A lot of the wool that's in the kits is Weeks. A lot of the uh, thread, not a lot of the threads, but some of the threads in the kit are Weeks. I'm using in my later work um, um, almost exclusively uh, Weeks, Cruel Weight uh, Lamb's Wool, and um, their fabrics are really, really nice. There is another um, website called Primitive I think it's called Primitive Gatherings uh, and they also have an excellent uh, selection um, of hand dyed wools over dyed really beautiful stuff um, one of the problems is that wool isn't cheap and if you need you know a two by two piece of yellow you have to buy a fat quarter that doesn't really work so a lot of times if you get working in uh, felted wool just uh, purchase things as you go and you can find small pieces and scraps and stuff and you have to have a stash and then when you go to make something uh, it's much easier because it's it's not inexpensive at all I mean 
a fat quarter of weeks right now is going for about uh, twenty two dollars so uh, that's why I kit because by the time you'd buy all these colors and put something together you'd be like into the hundreds of dollars uh, Deborah despite my best efforts uh, you've actually got me curious. May I ask a question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, to, to get the felted wool like you have, though, you have to use that dryer and washer technique, right? You just can't buy it. You can buy felted wool, absolutely. Oh, you uh, can. Oh, we, okay. Weeks, sure. yeah. Weeks Dye Works sells everything felted. Uh, uh, some people sell; they call it felted wool, but it's not. It's dyed. It's over dyed. So you. You need to kind of feel it and say, okay, is this felted or it's not felted? And if it's not felted to your liking, wet it and stick it in the dryer. And don't forget to clean the lint, lint trap because it's going to be loaded with hairs. So those three places are great for fabrics. And then when you go to quilt shows or anything like that, the quilt shops and some embroidery shops will carry um, stuff that they make by themselves or they get from cottage trade. Uh, but these three are the ones. Oh, and there's one more, I think, um, uh, website that I just started working with, and it's called the Wooly Ladies. Wooly Lady. Um, and it's woollylady.com. And they have a nice selection, too. Wooly lady. Uh, those ladies are up, up in, uh, where are they? Hmm, let me see. I think they're in Michigan. Uh, their wool looks to me like it isn't felted, but it's over dyed. Beautiful colors, but it's not really quite as, as plushy as I would like. I hope that helps in locating materials. Any other questions, guys? If there's no other questions, then my question for you is, would you like to have another online class, let's say in January or at some point in the future? Or do you just want to like email me or put posts to the group and I'll um, handle questions or concerns that come up from there? I mean, I like these venues. I try to keep them under an hour, and it's helpful to, you know, sometimes talk about it after you've been working. So that's up to you. This has been really useful, I think. I, the lecture that you had, I, I found it very useful. But then if, you, if, if we want to do and schedule another one, I'll be happy to schedule another one, maybe some people who haven't been able to attend can attend and uh, obviously we you know we can record these things as well so and put them out in the channel so I, I want to thank everybody for coming <laughs> it's nice to have you um, it was nice for me to be able to talk about my work in, in, in such detail and um, I hope you enjoy working on the piece and if anybody has any questions shoot me shoot an email to the group because whatever question you have somebody else might have it too i think uh, we have a nice system and well, I, I, I will i i have one materials question and it's a sure. uh, so the gum not poppy thread yes. is it green yes ah okay it's kind Our of a, a green it has a lot of yellow in it so it's that kind of green like a mossy yellow okay. green okay i was thinking it was a i was thinking red or orange for poppies but it's green so well they call that whole line of thread poppies and i don't know why they have like different gum nut has like the poppies line the daisy line oh, okay. okay i was thinking it was referring to the color so i was like no oh, right right which red that one is <laughs> <laughs> no it's a green it's uh yeah I, it's kind of it's, you know pond scum color <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay.